Welcome to Earth Science Lecture. This is Professor Diane L. Pomeroy, and this week we'll learn about the formation of the universe, solar system, and the Earth. According to the Big Bang Theory, the entire universe originated from a point smaller than an atom, approximately 13.8 billion years ago. This point, which was incredibly dense and hot, was known as the singularity. So that's not what's shown here on this image. That's the different Big Bang Theory. This is the one I'm referring to. So the singularity point was incredibly dense and hot, and it exploded in that moment 13.8 billion years ago, moving faster than the speed of light. The universe continues to expand, as evidenced by the presence of dark energy and the motion and wave frequencies of stars, planets, and galaxies. This diagram shows the main parts of the Big Bang event, dividing it into seven phases. Immediately after the Big Bang, clouds of superheated gas and cosmic radiation condensed due to gravity. These clouds contain millions of randomly moving particles, including quarks, neutrinos, plasma, and dark matter, for 400 million years, until the first stars developed from a process known as nuclear fusion. Protons and neutrons began to form from the particles in superheated gas clouds. These are parts of the nucleus, or center, of atoms, the basic unit of all baryonic or light matter in the observable universe. So on this slide, we have a diagram of an atom on the right, and in the center, we have the nucleus of the atom, which contains protons and neutrons. Orbiting the outside of this, we have very small electronegatively charged particles called electrons. And the image on the left is a photograph of an atom. Dark energy and dark matter make up about 95% of the observable universe combined, aside from cosmic microwave radiation and in the energy left over from nuclear fusion reactions. Dark matter does not absorb, reflect, or emit light, and the exact chemistry and origins of dark matter are unknown. The expansion of the universe is due to the presence of dark energy and dark matter. So this is an artist's rendering of the dark matter in the universe. An example of this would be the presence of black holes or possibly wormholes, any kind of substance that is the opposite of light energy. Now, with stars and with planets and most objects in the known universe, they are spherical for three reasons. One, gravity compresses them into this shape, and that shape is maintained because it is energy efficient. It holds to the law of conservation of energy and matter in the known universe. Two, multiple NASA missions to other worlds have sent satellite images that show these distinct spherical shapes. And three, a property that's known as geodesy. Geodesy allows us to measure planetary shape, gravity, and rotation of a planet on its axis. These calculations were first recorded by the Greeks over 2,000 years ago, who determined the circumference of the Earth. So in other words, the Earth is round, all the planets in the solar system are round, and stars in the known universe are round as well. Protostar development occurs in stages inside a nebula. The plural of nebula is nebulae. Nebulae are clouds of gas that are super dense and superheated. Atomic fusion between hydrogen atoms occurs inside this gaseous material to generate the stars. As heavier atoms from nuclear fusion are drawn towards each other through gravity, clumps of gas and dust will collapse in on each other, and through that intense heat, mass, and pressure, those clumps will develop into a flat disk from that gravitational force. That material will eventually burst into light and become what we call a protostar. This process takes millions of years, and much of star formation is still unknown. Stars develop planetary disks in the wake of their formation, as shown on this slide, and stars that have larger sizes will aggregate into clusters, which is what we call galaxies. More than half of all star systems will have two or three central stars rather than one, like our star system, our solar system. Our sun is average in a size comparison to most stars. It's a spectral class G star, 
and it produces a yellow color in the light spectrum due to its difference in temperature. This diagram shows our sun as compared to other stars in terms of color, temperature, and luminosity, or brightness. Small stars, known as dwarfs, burn brightly, usually in blue or white, and are hot. Larger stars, known as giants, are dimmer, usually in orange or red, and are cool. Galaxies form as the stars coalesce. To coalesce means that the stars are drawn towards one another due to differences in their mass and their gravity. So generally speaking in space, larger objects tend to have a greater gravitational hold on the smaller objects. Our spiral Milky Way galaxy formed approximately 10 billion years ago, and its edge can be seen in the night sky on Earth. The center of the galaxy, as shown on this illustration on the left, contains a supermassive black hole, and the sun is 10,000 light years away from that center point. We know the ages of star systems, like in the Milky Way, based on their luminosity. Younger stars glow brighter, and their distance, which is measured in light years as compared to Earth. Light years are how far light travels in one year. This photo by Bill Dunford in Utah shows the edge of the Milky Way in addition to some planets in our solar system, like Mars, Saturn, and Jupiter. The above diagram shows how close and how far objects are in comparison to Earth in terms of light. Brighter objects are comparatively closer than fainter ones. The distance between the Earth and the Sun is equivalent to one astronomical unit, or AU which is approximately 93 million miles distant. It takes about eight minutes for one beam of sunlight to reach the Earth's surface. This means that if the sun were to go completely dark, if it were to have its heat mass absorbed, and if it were to fail, uh, then it would take about eight minutes of lag time between the time that the sun went dark and the time that we noticed here on Earth. Ancient astronomers were limited to seeing only stars in the night sky above us from Earth, but the Hubble and other powerful telescopes, in addition to satellites, reveal stars, galaxies, and planets once unknown to us, many light years away. Our sun is just one star among billions in the known universe. In the center of this image, which is from an app called NASA's Eyes, we have the sun in yellow. The planets of our solar system formed with the collapse of the solar nebula and the birth of the sun 4.6 billion years ago. What this means is that, again, the sun and all of the planets, all of debris in the solar system, all of the asteroids and comets, all of that material, all the radiation from the sunlight, all of that is contained within our solar system and is timed to be 4.6 billion years old. In a later class, I'm going to show you how we came to this conclusion of the age of our solar system and of our planet. Through studying the development of other star systems, astronomers have recognized that our young solar system was a violent place with random collisions between planets and other debris. This illustration shows the development of the Epsilon Eridani system, which is similar to our own solar system. The debris in the young solar system orbited the protosun for millions of years before cooling and developing into protoplanets. Understand that our solar system, again, is unique in the way that it's structured in terms of the more dense planets being smaller than the large gas giants, and in addition to the fact that we only have a central star, one central star that burns at a spectral class G, it is yellow. Um, versus most star systems. Most star systems that we've encountered uh, well outside of the bounds of our solar system and galaxy, uh, they tend to have red to orange uh, giant stars, and they will tend to have two to three uh, stars in that star system with the stars orbiting one another and with the planets orbiting as well. So the area in our solar system that is closer to the protosun 
those materials are going to be hotter and more dense than the outermost regions that are shown in this illustration. So the terrestrial planets in our solar system form towards the center closer to the sun, again, because they're generally smaller objects and the greater density objects tend to be drawn towards uh, the stars that have the greater gravitational hold. And so that's what's happened here. The Jovian planets are the gas giants. Those developed on the outermost edge with all that excess hydrogen and helium that have been blasted off from the young sun billions of years ago. The small terrestrial planets formed through the repeated collision of dense rocky objects called planetesimals. These repeated collisions developed a spherical mass. As the sphere stabilized, a process called core accretion began where the heavier metallic elements, in this case iron and nickel, sank to the center, and the lighter elements, in this case silicon and oxygen, rose to the surface. This illustration shows the development of a terrestrial planet before its surface stabilized. The terrestrial planet superheated in dense metallic core developed first, followed by the rocky mantle and crust in a process known as differentiation. The heat that radiated from the core melted the surrounding rocks in the mantle, and the overlying crust developed as the uppermost mantle cooled. The core generates not only internal heat, which drives crustal motion in the process of plate tectonics, which we'll learn about in a later lecture, but also a magnetic field. The magnetic field of Earth protects its atmosphere from cosmic and solar radiation. So there's three major layers to all of the terrestrial planets. They all have a solid inner uh, metallic core and a molten to solid layered uh, mantle and crust that is made of rock material, again, mostly silicon and oxygen. The early Earth was prone to impact from asteroids, comets, and even other planets. The tilt of Earth's axis developed due to the collision of another protoplanet with Earth that was named Thea. How do we know that this phenomenon occurred? We have multiple lines of evidence to show that this had happened. First, the Earth's tilt on its axis itself is rather unique. Second, the density of Earth's core is much greater than what it should be for a terrestrial planet. In fact, planet Earth is the fifth largest planet in terms of its density. It's very dense. So how did this happen? How do we get an extra dense planet that's tilted on its axis this way? Well, it had to have been a collision event with another planet. The newly formed Earth was sideswiped by a Mars-sized planet named Thea approximately 4.5 billion years ago. But how do we know for sure that this is what happened? The presence of the Moon, in addition to the tilt of the Earth's axis and the mass of the Earth itself. The collision of both Thea and Earth tilted the Earth on its axis and destroyed part of its crust and mantle. This process caused those materials to coalesce and eventually form the moon, as shown in this GIF. Just as a warning, it is a flashing GIF. We know the chemical composition of the moon due to multiple Apollo missions to its surface, comparing its rocks to the rocks on Earth. The moon has the same chemistry as the Earth's mantle and crust, which again is primarily silicon and oxygen, as you can see in this illustration. So there's no core material, there's no uh, heavy metals or irons that are present. Instead, it's just mostly crustal material, mantle material. That is what the moon is made of. And the moon, again, is a sphere only because that material, as it condensed and collapsed to form a disk around the young Earth, would eventually become that spherical shape due to gravity and its compressional force. So after the collision of Earth with Thea, it began the process of differentiation all over again. It had a solid iron core at its center that was suspended in a liquid iron outer layer. And surrounding that, we have multiple layers of mantle and crust. The silica-rich rocks in the molten mantle and solidified mantle are forming at the crustal surface. The collision with the again made Earth much more dense than other terrestrial planets. Now this has been observed by astronomers with exoplanets discovered in what are known as the Kepler missions. So in the next lecture, we're going to learn more about interactions between the asthenosphere and the crust, which is a big part of the plate tectonics theory. 
The metallic core of the Earth produces a magnetic field, otherwise known as a magnetosphere. This field protects the Earth's surface from bombardment by solar radiation and solar wind. The magnetic field is not constant. Its strength fluctuates, and the magnetic field can flip over spans of thousands to millions of years of time. We'll learn more about these changes again in the plate tectonics lecture. The Earth's surface was very different from the Earth of today. It was incredibly violent and unstable. The Earth's surface was continuously bombarded by comets, asteroids, and even other planets, not to mention the volcanic activity that had run rampant on the earlier surface. During the very beginning of the Earth's formation, there was no oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere, and the Earth's surface again had no ocean for the first billion years of its existence. About three billion years ago, the magma in Earth's mantle began to ooze toward the rigid crust, developing the first volcanic regions on Earth, known as ridges and trenches. These splits in the crust eventually developed distinct areas that we term tectonic plates. The volcanoes and magma pools that covered the earlier surface released toxic chemicals like nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and water vapor into the atmosphere. This water vapor would eventually cool and condense and develop into liquid water. Pools of this liquid water would form not only on the Earth's surface, but beneath it as well. There are pools of groundwater that potentially have their source from billions of years ago, as recent studies have indicated. The oceans not only developed from these pools of water that formed from that volcanic activity, but they also developed from comets and asteroids that struck the young Earth's surface. So all of this process taken together is what is thought to have developed our oceans. And without the oceans, the Earth's life would not exist. This is where life began, in the deep sea, deep sea vents on Earth's surface. If you'd like to know more about the origins of life in the ocean, I encourage you to check out my oceanography playlist on my YouTube channel. The moon itself is a satellite. It's a rocky body that maintains an orbit around a larger planetary body by maintaining a speed faster than the planet's revolution and a distance great enough so it can't be pulled into that planet and then destroyed. So the moon is far enough away from the Earth's surface to where it won't get absorbed back into our gravitational hold and then absorbed into the planet once more. In addition, the moon's orbital path is faster than that of the Earth's orbital path around the sun. The lunar cycle, which is the period of the moon's revolution, is 28 Earth days, approximately, or one month. During the moon's orbit, its appearance seems to change, but this is due to the shadows the Earth casts on the bright surface, or the light side, of the moon. As the moon orbits the Earth, understand that only one side of the moon is shown to us at a time, that is the light side of the moon. In addition, the surface changes through major phases of this cycle. Those phases include the new moon, where we cannot see the moon from the Earth's surface because there's an alignment between the sun, the moon, and the Earth in the orbital paths. There's the quarter phase, where we are one quarter of a way through the lunar cycle. There's the full moon phase, which is the opposite side of the new moon phase, where now the moon is on the opposite side of Earth relative to the sun in their paths of orbit. And then finally, uh, third quarter, where the moon is moving around again, almost completing its revolution, and it goes back to new moon phase once more. So those are the four major phases of the lunar cycle. The lunar cycle and the proximity of the moon to the Earth and its orbit controls the tides of the oceans. The frictional forces generated between the oceans and the moon's surface push the moon away from the Earth. This, in turn, will lessen the tides over time. The continents of Earth were formed when the oceans covered Earth's surface. The movement of Earth's crust was better understood in the 1960s with the development of the theory of plate tectonics. There are four terrestrial planets in the solar system, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. All terrestrial planets have a core, mantle, and crust. 
the Earth is the most dense terrestrial planet, and again, it's the only one that we've encountered that has liquid water on its surface to the volume that it does. Mercury is a planet that is much closer to the Sun, and because of its faster rate of rotation, uh, the aging process is different on Mercury than it is on Earth. One Mercury year is 88 Earth days. Venus, its surface is slightly different only because it had a runaway greenhouse effect early on in its formation. This was due to excessive volcanic eruption. Volcanoes on Venus are absolutely immense and their constant eruption is what developed these super dense clouds of sulfuric acid and carbon dioxide gas which cover the surface of that planet. So Venus is completely covered in these gases and it rains uh, sulfuric acid on the surface. So we've never actually successfully landed on Venus because of this. Aside from Earth, there is Mars, and Mars at one point in its 4.6 billion year history did have a similar appearance to that of Earth. It had liquid water on its surface, much like we do today, and it did have polar ice caps. What happened to the surface of Mars is that its magnetic field failed early on in its formation. This process gradually winnowed away the atmosphere of Mars, resulting in this desert surface that we have today. The Jovian or gas giant planets formed on the edge of the solar disk. Cooler gas, usually in the form of hydrogen, helium, or methane, left over from the formation of the Sun, coalesce quickly around their solid rocky cores. These immense planets have huge gravitational forces, despite being made almost entirely out of gas. Jupiter is an immense planet. It has over 60 moons that orbit it, and uh, it protects us from bombardment by asteroids and comets. It absorbs them. In the 80s, it absorbed a series of comets that could have exploded the Earth one time over each time that they collided with Jupiter's surface. Jupiter, its pressure is so immense that some hydrogen gas that is swirling about in its atmosphere can actually be compressed and condensed into liquid hydrogen. And this generates immense thunderstorms and severe hurricanes on the surface of this world. Saturn, its moons were compressed into a ring, a series of rings, uh, which again are millions and millions of moons that are that never coalesce to form that solid spherical shape that we see uh, with Jupiter's moons or even with our own moon. Uranus and Neptune are the most distant planets in the solar system. Uh, Uranus has a, an odd orbital path as does Neptune, yet because they are large enough to sustain their own gravity, uh, gravitational hold, they are still classified as planets. And on this image, we have Earth uh, as a size comparison. The four Jovian planets in order are Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Recent satellite image missions to Jupiter and Saturn uh, they reveal these planets in much greater detail than ever before. Here's some images of Jupiter. I honestly feel like this planet, it looks very much like an Impressionist painting, almost like a Monet or something like that. Very beautiful uh, swirls of gas and clouds of dust. Here are some images of Saturn from the Cassini mission. Uh, this was, I think, one of the last flybys that the satellite did before it collided with the planet's surface and blew up. And so here we have our rings of Saturn that have, again, been compressed together uh, to make this uh, beautiful appearance. Finally, I would like to discuss this particular object. This is no longer considered a planet in our solar system. This is Pluto. Pluto is too small to affect other planets in terms of its gravity and its odd orbital path. So in other words, Pluto doesn't make the same path as the other planets. It doesn't have that elliptical pattern that the other planets make. It doesn't quite follow Kepler's laws to the T that the other planets do. Um, and so because of this, these things taken together, 
Uh, Pluto is no longer considered a part of our solar system technically in terms of as an official planet. It's been classified as a dwarf planet since 2006. Pluto is part of the Kuiper belt, which is a series of dwarf planets and other objects, things like comets and other types of debris that surround the edge of our solar system. In turn, this is further surrounded by other objects known as the Oort cloud, O-O-R-T. And the Oort cloud is essentially what, again, protects the uh, solar system from bombardment by other solar systems in neighboring galaxies. This slide shows recent satellite images of the planets in the solar system, again, excepting Pluto, which is not a planet. And we actually have much better satellite images uh, of Pluto from New Horizons uh, that have since been updated. This slide shows the scale of our solar system. Note that Earth is the third planet in this system. And note how large the sun is, despite being one of the smaller stars in the known universe. So next time, we're going to learn more about the Earth's surface through the theory of plate tectonics. I hope that you enjoyed this lecture, and thanks for watching.